Okay, if I can welcome everyone to this, the third meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2020. The first item on our agenda today is a decision to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is consideration of continued petitions. The first continued petition for consideration today is petition 1662 on improved treatment for patients with Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases lodged by Janie Kingjan and Lorraine Murray on behalf of Tick-Borne Illness Campaign. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to improve testing and treatment for Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases by ensuring that medical professionals in Scotland are fully equipped to deal with the complexity of tick-borne infections, addressing the lack of reliability of tests, the full variety of species in Scotland, the presence of persistent bacteria, which are difficult to eradicate, and the complexities caused by the presence of possibly multiple co-infections, and to complement this with a public awareness campaign. The committee has received a submission from the Scottish Government, as well as submissions from the petitioners, detailing the criticisms of the NICE guidelines that are currently in place, responding to the roundtable of evidence session held last September, and provides an update on international developments over recent years. The committee has also received written testimonies from the petitioners and members of the public detailing their personal stories with Lyme disease and co-infections. A submission has also been received from Dr John S. Lambert, a hospital consultant and university professor in medicines and infectious diseases. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Uh, thank you, Kevin. I think this, this uh, you know, that, uh, I was struck very much by the evidence we took early on and how debilitating this, this disease is. And, and as it transpires, a, 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 a cousin of mine who works in the forestry department has recently uh, contracted Lyme disease to a point where he's had to give up work. So I think the, the, uh, the disease itself, um, uh, you know, we're, we're learning how debilitating it happens to be. I think what we also heard in evidence the, uh, you know, the disparity of opinion between uh, general practitioners and practitioners around whether or not Lyme disease can come down from the highlands and of course i mean you know we've heard evidence that it's it's it's, it's across the board so i think it's a it's a, the petitioners has brought up it's a very strong petition and i would like to uh, i would suggest that we write to the scottish government just to raise the concerns uh, the petitions have raised in their submissions and it's also my understanding that uh, the rc the royal college of gps uh, haven't responded to the correspondence that we asked them before and I wonder whether we can give them uh, a little dunt, a chivvy along, uh, to see if they would give us back. Uh, mm. the, 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 the I mean, even if it is have. for them to see, well, actually, there's an issue that they've not considered. That would yeah. be in itself, I think, yeah. would be would be interesting. I mean, I'm struck. We have had a lot of yeah. submissions and personal <laughs> testimony, as well as you know, um, clearly um, a number of experts in the field. And one of the themes, I think, is this is not just Lyme disease; it's also other ticks. And therefore, the system is not geared up to the, the complexity of it. I mean, it is very complex. I don't pretend to understand a lot of the technicalities of it. But some people saying that they got a diagnosis very late because mm -hmm. people didn't know what to look for. And as a consequence, their illness was even more debilitating. Mm -hmm. um, and a sense that I suppose what I picked up from it is that the NICE guidelines are not up to date and that they're not hearing or perhaps not... There's a sense whether this is true or not, but if it comes from the person who's unwell, that they're not being believed, and therefore there's a shift over from maybe a diagnosis around tick to looking at other issues. Yeah, Deal? Um, I would absolutely agree with that. I've got a, a friend who has finally been diagnosed with Q fever um, after at least 10 years of going back and forth to different doctors and, and you know, being misdiagnosed. And, and you're absolutely right in what you say about not being believed. And, um, you know, from a lot of the submissions that we've had here, um, if it had been picked up a lot earlier, it would have been a lot easier to treat. Um, so I absolutely agree with um, Brian Whittle's suggestion about writing to uh, the Royal College of GPs and um, also the Scottish Government as well, because although there is a lot of good work, and we did hear about some of the work when we did the round table evidence, you know, about prevention and awareness and all that sort of stuff. I think that there's maybe not so much work going on in the diagnostic and treatment side, and that's where we need to be concentrating. There now. seems to be a lack of confidence in 
the tests that are applied as well. Absolutely. Morris? Can I also suggest, um, Chair, I agree with both those statements and, uh, and both of my colleagues, but also I, I did ask the question, I posed it in one of the last sessions, um, about the, the, the public information campaign, and I don't... And I believe that obviously we've seen the reply from the, vet the British Veterans Association on the 13th of September to say that they're still not happy that the sort of public campaign is out there. Uh, so I, I would like to be, have them written, uh, the, to write to the British Veterans Association again just to sort of quantify what's happening because they've obviously highlighted that again. So well, would, the, would the thing about the public um, information campaign be, they've asked for it, should it be about the Scottish Government? Well, that's my point. Uh -huh. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Look, they've asked for this. This is something that seems eminently sensible. How yeah. do we keep people safe? How do we prevent it? Exactly. And, you know, again, I don't know. We, there's none of us here an expert on the technicalities. All this. Clearly, um, the medical profession is wrestling with all of this. It's hugely complex. Mm -hmm. But that sense of, that, that in some ways the system is not recognising that, although the experts are... At least in part, yeah. telling us there's very complex more work needs to be yeah. done. Really, through yeah. perhaps through the, the chief medical officer, yeah. we should be yeah. asking, um, you know, what work are they doing around yeah. Yeah. Um, that part of it, which is getting together the people who yeah. really understand um, there is an issue. Can I also suggest that the, the NFU might get, might sort of bring the NFU at Scotland into this, and maybe um, the Scottish Landowners Association? Yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of groups who've been involved in. Um, in an awareness campaign, but I think I think if I, I'm being reminded that the, um, the I think it was the, the Veterans Association said that they want the Scottish government to lead in an awareness yeah, campaign, yeah, and that kind yeah, of made I just sense. Feel, so, yeah. mm -hmm, so we can we can pursue we can that. Put some pressure on that. Yes, yeah. as long as that's included, yeah, yeah, Chair. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Anything else on that then? Okay. I think we are recognising um, there are still concerns, significant concerns, but actually properly understanding. Um, the issues in, in, in here and really that I think the, from the petitioner's point of view they want more urgency around looking at, the, at all of that and there's a whole number of areas including um, the awareness campaign that we'd want the Scottish Government to address and we would be keen to hear from the Royal College of GPs and we appreciate how busy they may be but even if it were simply to say that this is something they feel that they've not even really been mm -hmm. had flagged up to them in a significant way I think that would be useful. Is that agreed? agreed? In that case, we can move on. The second continued petition for consideration today is Petition 1688 on Permitted Development Rights in Conservation Areas, lodged by Alistair Ewan on behalf of Westerton Garden Suburb Residents Association. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the Permitted Development Rights legislation, which the petitioner believes unfairly impacts on residents of conservation areas and listed buildings in Scotland. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government about their ongoing work around implementing the Planning Scotland Act 2019. The Scottish Government response advises the planning performance and fees consultation was launched on 18 December 2019. The consultation recognises that, quote, the concerns have been raised recently about the requirement to submit an application for planning permission for carrying out alterations to a property which would have otherwise been carried out under permitted development rights. We propose that where applications are submitted under categories 2, 3, 4 and 5 for developments in conservation areas, areas which are required because of the restriction on permitted development, then in only half of the fee would be payable. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, I can absolutely um, see where this petition is trying to go, and I th you know I think that petitioner absolutely has a point. Also, conservation areas are there for the conservation of the area, obviously. Um, but the Scottish Government have said that they are going to publish um, new fee arrangements in quarter two of this year. So, I mean, I don't know if we've had any, um, if we've had any news about what's going to be in that at all. I don't think we did, but I, I think that you know, if that's going to be coming out, then mm -hmm. we take no, I think there was that. A, uh, I think there was a recognition that there is an issue here, yeah. that we have to live in a conservation area because of our desire to conserve the um, 
architectural heritage, people end up having to um, pay more mm -hmm. to do basic things that wouldn't happen in other areas and that that's felt to be unfair. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the, the consultation has recognised that. The issue is whether what they suggest, which is that you only have to pay half the fee, um, is fair, but they are consulting on it. Um, so I wonder whether it would be possible for us to close the petition on the basis that they are consulting, but that we flag up to the Scottish Government um, that these concerns have been expressed through the petition and perhaps to encourage the petitioners to engage with the consultation with them, process yeah. Yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. So I'm, I think the consultation is closing this coming Friday, or last Friday. Um, the timing, that's unfortunate, but I think that certainly we can perhaps, um, we can certainly write to the Scottish Government yeah, and flag yeah. up these concerns um, on behalf of the petition. I think that would be fair to say because that's been our consideration. They may indeed have engaged with it themselves anyway if they were, if they were um, alert to it and alive to it, but it's also something that um, we can do. You know, and I'd agree with that. That's the flavour of what I was getting from them and okay. um, recognition that something had to be done. So okay. I, I would support that. I think close and then see what comes out of this consultation. Okay. But flagging up the points you've made, Chair. Okay. Is that agreed then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so we would agree to close the petition um, under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that Scottish Government is currently undertaking a planning, performance and fees consultation, which includes issues such as permitted development rights, um, and obviously um, the petitioner uh, has the opportunity to return to this petition in a year's time if they feel there hasn't been any progress and we want to thank them very much for their engagement with the committee um, and for the time they've taken to raise these important issues. Um, and if we can now move on to the third continued petition for consideration today, which is petition 1710 um, on community hospital and council care home service in Scotland, lodged by Edward Archer. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the provision of services for the elderly and long-term sick in community and cottage hospitals, as well as council care homes across Scotland. Since our last consideration of this petition in September 2019, the Committee has received submissions from the Scottish Government, Glasgow City Integrated Joint Board, Health and Care Scotland and the petitioner. These submissions have been summarised in our meeting papers. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I think, Chair, that it should be, we should refer this to the Health and Sport Committee because there is obviously ongoing, it's, it's part of the ongoing discussions, and I obviously Brian want to comment, but mm -hmm. I, I would see this as something that needs to be passed on to that committee because uh, if we look at it in separately, then I think we might have some issues. So I think we should uh, refer it upwards. Okay, Brian? Um, yeah, but I think, you, as you know, myself and, and Dave Torrance sit on the Health and Sport Committee and we're looking at this um, topic specifically. Um, I think it's a very it, it's a very pertinent uh, topic at the moment. Um, I think it's a sector that's under extreme pressure at the moment, as has been highlighted by the petitioner. Uh, and it's something that I think, you know, that this parliament will, you know, will wrestle, wrestle with on an ongoing basis. But I do think I agree with uh, Morris Corey that um, perhaps uh, it, it, the best way forward would be to take the, uh, the petition and, and the evidence that we've taken and pass that on to the Health and Support Committee and add that uh, into, the, uh, um, into the, the, the work that we are currently doing. I think they're best placed to deal with us. Yeah. Okay. I mean, certainly I thought that I mean, we're very grateful for the, the the number of responses we had to this, and I think the response from Glasgow in particular is very considered. And the argument really is there shouldn't just be provision for somebody in their home or you're in, you know, um, you're in hospital. How do we find a place that kind of meets needs in between the two? And I'm actually quite reassured that there seems to be quite a lot of initiatives in different places with a kind of step down. So you're not bed blocking, but you're not being forced to go back home, but there is a space where you can be um, properly assessed. There's clearly a lot of work to be done in it, and I think we would be keen um, to see that being fed into the work of the Health and Sports Committee, mm -hmm. um, which I think is looking at the future delivery of social care in Scotland. Um, and so I think that we're probably in agreement, recognising the big issues here, 
um, important issues um, and challenging issues as well. Um, but obviously that's something the Health and Sport Committee itself is very much aware of. So we're agreeing to um, refer the petition to the Health and Sports Committee under Rule 1562 of Standing Orders to be considered as part of its work exploring the future delivery of social care in Scotland and what's required to meet future needs. And there's a particular element from this petition, I think, we would hope that could be a strand of that for the committee. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay, in that case, um, we're agreeing to close the petition. Can I thank the petitioner very much for highlighting these issues to us? Oh, we're referring it. Good start to my day. Um, we're referring the petition, as we've already agreed, and um, we do hope that the petitioner finds that the attention of it to the... the Health Committee is useful in their concerns with these issues. We can then move on to the fourth continued petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1713 on ban the use of mosquito devices in Scotland, lodged by a Amy Lee Freoli, M MSYP, and Kit McCarthy, MSYP, on behalf of the Scottish Youth Parliament. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ban outright the use of mosquito devices in Scotland in order to uphold children and young people's rights. In correspondence received from the Scottish Government, it states that it opposes the use of mosquito devices and intends to consult with specialists in relevant fields and give further consideration to the implications and practicalities of banning mosquito devices. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, Gail? Yeah, I, I mean, I've got huge sympathy with this petition. I've um, dealt with uh, some uh, members of the Youth Parliament with this um, and... Uh, in, in previous occasions, um, I think it is um, I think it is unfortunate that while the Scottish government um, doesn't support the use of them, they are still being used in various places, and um, they can be um, extremely upsetting for young people. Um, also, um, really quite disappointed to see that the UK government is not seeking to ban or restrict the devices. Um, and obviously to, to say to the uh, two members here, but also, you know, the Scottish Youth Parliament as a whole, that maybe they want to take that to the UK Parliament as, you know, they have the, the um, responsibility for that. But um, certainly, you know, I think that we, we can't take it any further. Um, and whilst to have great sympathy, I think that we have no option but to close it. Okay. I think certainly one of the things that is clear that while the Scottish Government recognises that ultimately in order for it to be banned, the UK Parliament need to make that decision, they are prepared to look at the, the question we asked them before, was whether under health grounds or whatever there was a way Absolutely. in for them. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's, it's, um, there is a space there clearly for the petitioners to continue, or indeed the Scottish Youth Parliament, if it so chose, to continue in dialogue with the Scottish Government round that doing. element yeah, of absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. OK, we're agreeing then to close the petition under Standing Order Rule 15.7 on the basis the Scottish Government will consult with specialists and give further consideration to the implications and practicalities of banning or limiting use of mosquito devices. And I think the point that um, Gail Ross makes about highlighting perhaps the Scottish Youth Parliament that this may be an issue they want to pursue with their colleagues across the UK. Yeah, and they may already have done that, to be fair. It might be something yeah. that they're already engaged with. Yeah. But we are agreeing to close it. And we would wish to thank the petitioners um, for bringing this to our attention. And again, if they so desired, they may have the opportunity to raise this um, in a year's time. Although I expect, and I know, I know at least one case that um, the young person is no longer in the Scottish Youth Parliament, just by the very nature of it, they will have, yeah. they will have moved on. But we want to thank them very much for engaging with the committee. If we could then move on to the next continued petition for consideration today which petition 1726 on primary hyperparathyroidism lodged by Fiona Killen, calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to raise awareness, particularly amongst GPs and other medical practitioners, of the symptoms, diagnosis and effective treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism, PHPT, caused by adenoma. To provide access to minimally invasive surgery in Scotland for the treatment of this condition and provide funding for research into PHPT, caused by adenoma. Since the last meeting, submissions have been received from the Scottish Government, Society for Endocrinology, 
Parathyroid UK and the Royal College of GPs Scotland. A briefing paper summarises these responses and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I, 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 it's in, this is a really interesting uh, petition in that it's, it's another one of these ones where we're calling uh, for, for upskilling almost of, of GPs and there seems to be a series of these coming through where uh, there's a recognition that, uh, or a lack of recognition of a of a condition within uh, within the, the, the wider uh, sort of medical medical community. So I, I think we're, we're back at that you know uh, position where we're writing to the Scottish government to ask them what they can do to promote uh, knowledge of this particular condition within uh, our, our GP surgeries. And and I'm just wondering whether there's a wider piece of work here around a, a number of conditions. Uh, that we could do in terms of, of, of promotion within uh, uh, GP surgeries in the wider medical community? Because it seems to be that the same, although there's a, there are a lot of different conditions, it seems to be the same basic issue and lack of uh, lack of understanding and knowledge. I wonder, well, there's a whole question I in our conversations had with GPs in, in, in regard to other matters. <coughs> Just so much pressure they're under as generalists, and they're quite right to say we are generalists. What are the sports that you could put in place to support GPs um, to be able to, d to deal with all of that in a world where everything is more complex and there are conditions which are um, perhaps coming to public attention in, in, in different ways? But I think, I think um, it would be worth writing to the Scottish Government to ask them about what work it's doing around this whole question. If we're going to take take that 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 uh, tact, um, uh, convener, there's a, there's a wider piece of work currently being done um, around healthcare tech uh, and and a new platform, a, a new technology platform, collaboration platform that uh, could hold this kind of information. Um, and I think it would be uh, if, if, we're, if we're going to you know trying to think logically how we we can't just take all of these conditions. And teach teach doctors about them because, the, the, as you say, they're generalists. Mm -hmm. But it'd be it'd be worth, I think, because I've actually seen the work that's been done uh, just now. Um, I think Mr. Huggins was, is leading that. Um, it'd be worth to see whether or not the plan would be as part of that work to 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 set up this sort of reservoir of of, uh, of knowledge of which things like this can be fed into and you know and be accessed to by GPs. I wonder, is, is the issue whether the sign and NICE guidelines are not sufficient to help mm. GPs? And that might be yeah, something yeah. we could... We uh, could um, I mean, there has been a suggestion that we, you know, it, if there was a way of um, asking Scottish Government whether they would look at a survey of GPs to get their understanding of this condition, but it may... You know, and whether that is the issue that they haven't got a reference point to go to that's given them enough information and what are the signifiers, again... A, I, I, I'm very conscious we're straying into clinical um, understanding that we can't possibly appreciate, but that whether there is something there about when they look to get advice or support to yeah. identify something, what is already there is not sufficient. If you're going to do that, um, if that which I think is a, 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 a really positive thing to do, if we're going to do that, I would tag on other, you know, what's your understanding of this, 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 this and this? How do you how how would you access mm -hmm. knowledge well, that's of these conditions? What we're saying is we're going to ask the Scottish government about whether they would have such a survey. Yeah, and presumably in that correspondence we'd say that we have conscious that in the public petitions committee, like anywhere else, there's a whole number of these things. But is this something that they would look at in yeah. terms of, given the kind yeah. of level of support that we think GPs Correct. need? I don't think we're, we're um, want to put stuff at the door of GPs simply on their own if they're if they're not if there's not the backup that they can draw in to help them. Okay. Um, but we're, we're recognising that there is an issue here. And the last one is this whole question of research into PHP team. We can ask the Scottish Government with that as well. I have a, a constituent, actually, where this was not picked up for a year and, and obviously it's led to certain disabilities now. Um, and when they sort of spoke to the GP himself, it was about you know getting some more guidance um, on identifying this issue. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the survey for the GPs would be excellent um, mm -hmm. because clearly, as you say, that as it says, that you know that they're generalists, and um, whilst they try to be you know, more detailed in their diagnosis, it's obviously very often they haven't got the mm -hmm. the, the backup to that, and that's what the Scottish government okay. should be looking at. Um, and so, there are these more more um, frequent situations like that. Okay, so we're agreeing tonight to the Scottish Government asking them about 
the work they, they, um, they're doing on this whole area and whether they would consider um, a survey of GPs and whether they're looking at the issue of uh, funding for uh, PHPT. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, in that case, we can move on to the next continued petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1729 on legal protection of Crofts from local authority care charges lodged by John McKeever. The petition calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure crofting tenancies are exempt from local authority finance assessments for care charges. Since the petition was last considered in September 2019, the committee's... Oops, sorry, my apologies... Yeah. Where have I gone to? Mm -hmm. oh, here it is here. So the petition calls the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure Croft tenants are exempt from local authority financial assessments for care charges. Um, and I wonder if members have any comments for suggestion or action. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we, we said last time that this was a, a really difficult situation and um, since we've had the evidence back, um, I think, I'm not, sh I'm not entirely sure if it makes it any clearer, to be completely honest with you. Um, so I, I note that the submissioner um, said that they were disappointed that Highland Council hadn't come back. Um, I am also disappointed that... Highland Council um, didn't respond, given that there was that situation um, on Sky. I think that the Scottish Government, through the um, Crofting Bill Group, which is um, tasked with looking at crofting law reform, um, has stated, and, and it says here in our papers, that in order to establish the um, standard security provision for Croft tenancies, then Croft tenancies need to be seen as assets in order for them um, to be able to do that. Um, there is some differentiation of opinion between the petitioner and the Scottish Government about whether or not it adversely impacts on the system of Croft and when a sale um, of a, a Croft tenancy happens. Um, I think that that's it's really quite subjective. Um, I think also that the uh, stuff that we got back from the Western Isles Council about, um, you know, they are simply just following the, the guidelines that are there already and they're treating everything um, on a case-by-case -case basis is essentially what they are saying. Um, I think that we really need to get the views of the Scottish Government now to find out, you know, why there is such discrepancies across local authorities. Um, do they need to provide more clarity to uh, local authorities that have crofting communities as to, you know, whether they should be seen as assets or just just to get a, a an absolute. Um, because I mean, well, I think I said before when we were in rural committee, and we were doing the crofting inquiry. Um, you know, even QCs were coming in and giving us evidence saying that Crofting Law was one of the most complicated legal systems that, you know, they dealt with. So um, I think that there is some further clarification that we need to seek um, for this petitioner. Yeah. I mean, I was quite struck by the, I think from the petitioner, um, talking about the distinction between somebody who's decrofted mm -hmm. and have, have a property and somebody for whom, I mean, used to call it a an improvement that a croft house was seen as an improvement on a tenancy, okay, okay. and the distinction between um, people who are who are tenants they may own their house, but they're tenants on the, on yeah. the croft, yeah. um, and those who are owner occupiers. And I think some of it feels like a bit of a misunderstanding about that. And I'm I'm sure there would be plenty of people who would argue that it would have an impact on 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 yeah. actually the sustainability of crofting because of. Um, the kind of I find quite powerful points in in the evidence we've give, been given, yes. um, and it seemed to me that a guy on Butte had simply said, "Oh well," and it it, it almost was the one I think that the petitioner made felt that made most sense. They just took it on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we can't um, exclude the fact that clearly there's a, an issue around pressure on local authorities around their finances. So if they can. You know, count as an asset in one place. Why can't they count it in, in, in a crofting setting? But I, I do think the two things are are distinct, at least in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we can um, 
look at right into the Scottish Government asking for clarity. I mean, it may be there for they will say, well, we're dealing with it, I think, you used to call it the Crofting Bill Group. Yeah. But I, I think we'd want some reassurance that clarity is required because it would look as if if you're a, a crofting tenant in one area, you'd be treated quite differently from another area. Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that the crofting legislation being is well, um, yeah. supposed to be yeah. coherent, um, whether they, they have a plan to update the CAF class set section of their guidance, um, and perhaps, again, just really trying to get Scottish Government to engage directly with the concerns of the petitioner, which I think are pretty clear. Absolutely. Okay, is that agreed? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I remember some of these cases well, and it was a case that we, we took a decision in the case case by case because there are so many variables in it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the tenant was absent, I mean, it wasn't there, it's somebody else looking after the craft, and that's how you deal with that. He didn't, he or she hadn't, wasn't really in the area. Mm -hmm. um, there were masses, so that's why we came down on the line of case by case because mm -hmm. we couldn't see how we do it. We didn't have many cases, but mm -hmm. that's how we dealt with it. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the very fact that Crofton has its own legislation, um, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it's, it's a unique way of life and mm -hmm. has to be protected. OK. Therefore, if that's agreed, we're going to write to the Scottish Government in those terms. Absolutely. OK, if we can then move on to the next continued petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1730 on Registration of Home Educated Children in Scotland, lodged by Kenneth Drysdale. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to conduct an urgent review to identify children who are not registered with an education authority in Scotland and are being denied a basic human right to access an education suitable for to age, ability and aptitude. Since the publication of the meeting papers, the petition has provided an additional submission which provides information on how often local authorities have used the powers under Section 37 of the Education Act 1980 to issue a notice to parents following concerns that a child has not been receiving efficient education. This, this submission has been circulated to members and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Okay, I'll go. Mm. <laughs> I think... I think uh, I think this, this is quite a complicated uh, petition for me because I think we probably all have uh, uh, we all have uh, constituency cases where um, homeschooling has has become uh, the only option uh, in certain circumstances, uh, and, and it does it does sit with me how, how that how you know worry me how that 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 child uh, um, then gains interaction with with with, with uh, other children. That's always been my my concern. Um, so I think um, I think the petitioner makes uh, a very a very strong point, and, and I do think that because there's there's a there's a revised home education guidance publication in the offing, um, I think maybe in the first instance we could write to the Scottish government and to seek clarifications in the timescales that that will be delivered on, um, and potentially and there's potentially a, 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 a an opportunity here to write to COSLA. And look at the, you know, to seek details of local authority provisions and what they have in place. You know, make sure they're fulfilling this statutory duty uh, under the Education Act. So I think that there's probably two, a couple of things that we could do here to uh, to move this forward. I do think it's something that we do need to we need to pursue. Okay. Any other views? Yeah. Can I just draw a point, uh, Chair? And looking at the submission, um, <coughs> the 11th of February, there, and then looking down at the, the five. Uh, local authorities have obviously given in their, their responses. I mean, South Ayrshire, 21, that's quite a high level. I mean, I've been responsible I, I, for some of them. What? I've been responsible for some of them, I think. <laughs> um, you know, there's obviously some inconsistency. I think you're absolutely right. I think I support the fact that the two points we just, my colleague, have said is, is we need to write to both the Scottish Government and Scottish Government to get some uniformity in this. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think certainly, you know, um, in my own experience, I can understand why in certain circumstances, first of all, parents actively choose to home educate. Um, and secondly, perhaps in certain circumstances feel they have no choice because the child is struggling inside the education system or the education system is not sufficiently responsive or supportive of them. But the other side of it, from the perspective of somebody who spent quite a significant part of my professional life as a teacher trying to make sure that young people um, got the education they were entitled to, regardless of whether 
you know, in, in circumstance where perhaps there was um, not the family support to get them into school and so on, um, which is these are two different, completely different things, but that sense of a responsibility to ensure that a child has access to an education, and the right to an education, and how that's done, um, I think that's quite a, an important balance to strike. And I suppose that's the reassurance that we would be seeking as well. Yeah. Or I think that's what's perhaps, in, in a sense, what comes from under the petition, but um, I don't think anyone would suggest that we wouldn't support home education, but that that um, importance of a young person's access to education is part of it as well. Yeah. So we're agreeing to write to Scottish Government and to cause land those terms. Okay. In that case, if we can move on. The next continued petition for consideration today is Petition 1732 on a toolkit for working with pathological demand avoidance profile of ASD, lodged by Patricia Hewitt and Barbara Irvin. The clerk's note provides a summary of the submissions received since the last consideration of the petition. Notably, the National Autistic Society Scotland sent a second updated submission on 28th of January 2020, following a change to their stance on pathological demand avoidance. Members may also wish to note that Rhoda Grant MSP provided a written submission to the clerks yesterday, and we've had that in hard copy today. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, <coughs> I think when we first uh, when we first got this the petition and heard this petition, you know, I think the the agreement was that there seems to be a, a lack of cohesiveness and understanding uh, uh, across uh, from from one you know one area to another. I think the other thing that, that struck me um, with the National Autistic Society's uh, submission was the, the their feeling that the understanding of autism was poor, mm -hmm. um, and I think the the um, again. You know the PD uh, PSD uh, uh, comes under the, the 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 spectrum of autism as well. I think we 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 agreed with that. So to me, there's there's, there's a there's a, a a theme running through this once again of this kind of um, lack of understanding in the medical medical world, or lack of understanding at council level that this this is actually a condition. And uh, um, but the, the but the wider one for the wider worry for me is is this idea around that, that autism itself is not particularly well understood and recognised. So I, I think there's, there's a big bit of work to be done here. Uh, I'm not sure that we can take this any the, the, the limited you know, responses we had and actions we can do in terms of petition. Um, I do think it's a really important uh, important uh, subject that the petition has brought forward, but uh, if we're looking at what this petition committee can do, I'm not sure we can do much more. Okay. Yeah, Gail? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, I think that the petitioners um, have certainly done a, a, a lot of um, good work to try and and get this recognised. Um, I think that the fact that the response that we got from the National Autistic Society said that um, PDA is, is seen within the spectrum um, but, you know, Brian's absolutely right, whether or not the understanding of the spectrum is something that needs to be looked at rather than um, individual um, conditions within it is, I suppose, another question. But, um, I, you know, as to where we can take it as a committee any further, I mean, we've already been advised that we're, we're not going to be able to go anywhere with the ask for the toolkit. So I think, unfortunately, we have taken it as far as we possibly can. Yeah. I mean, I'm quite struck by um, the submission from the National Autistic Society because I don't... It's not, I think, that people are not recognising that there are particular features for some particular people within this, this um, autism spectrum, which would be described as PDA. Mm. Um, and clearly their job is to make you know the world as user friendly to people with autism as pro as possible and to have a proper understanding of the different ways in which it may be expressed um and it does say within the research there's some consensus that the term pda may be a useful term to flag up in a range of co-occurring co -co 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 difficulties for many people um and that any approach should be personalized to the needs of the individual so it's not that there's not recognition that there are particular features, but that really the whole issue around autism is making it as person-centred as possible. 
so that you don't just generalise well, you don't fit in that, so we're not going to deal with you. We want to deal with you the way that, that you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, from that perspective, I think I agree with the committee that, in terms of what the public petitions usefully can do, we have flagged this up, we've highlighted it. Clearly, the National Law Society and others are aware of it, mm -hmm. and that their, their approach would suggest that it's not that you disregard people whose autism um, is expressed in this way through PDA, but that it is within that, it's, it's all within that umbrella, I guess. Chair, I think as a, in the submission from the um, Autistic Society, obviously there's there's an acceptance of the toolkit, a toolkit, but as you say, it's individual cases, and I think mm -hmm. it must be included in the overall thing because you know, there's clearly government support for that, but, and, and also so there's a fair consensus, but again, it's within that spectrum. I don't think there's much more we can do mm -hmm. other than, um, I mean, I feel there's comfortable there's work going on, there's recognition of it, um, mm -hmm. and doing everything, because one, it's not a question of one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we also would want to acknowledge the impact of the evidence session on this, that there is clearly, you know, the very fact of, of having the petitioners in front of us did increase awareness of, the, of their concerns and there has been engagement and we wouldn't expect that, that engagement to stop. So we would be agreeing to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis that there's limited support for the actions called for in the petition but recognising that the issues of the experience of people with autism is very much something we would want um, to be of continued attention. And I have absolutely no doubt that the National Autistic Society and other groups representing people with autism in Scotland and indeed the campaigners around PDA wouldn't let that happen anyway. Um, so we would want to thank the petitioners very much for engaging with the committee um, and for highlighting um, their, their concerns in this in this regard and thank them for um, all of that and of course recognise that if there isn't progress in a way that they feel is satisfactory this is something that can be brought back as a, as a, as a petition in a year's time. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. if we can then, if that's agreed, if we can move on to the final continued petition for consideration today which is petition 1739 on improve access to weight loss surgery lodged by Tom Aldridge. Since lodging the petition, the petitioner has contacted the committee clerks to indicate that he's been advised by National Health Service officials that the policy the petitioner is seeking to change has been amended. The Scottish Government responded to the committee confirms this. Um, therefore, are members any comments or suggestions for action? Okay. Now, given the, uh, the, the, the petition seems to have been successful and they've got the result that they wanted, um, I've got to thank them for that. Congratulate them and uh, close the petition. Yeah, is that agreed? Success. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so we're agreeing to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis that the weight loss surgery is available to any patient who local clinicians feel may benefit when other weight management interventions have been explored. So there has been an amendment to the policy in the way that the petitioner had desired, um, and therefore we would be agreeing to close the petition and thank the petitioner for their engagement. Um, with the committee and obviously um, if in a year's time that they don't feel there's progress following that decision there's something that can be brought back to the committee yep. um, and we agree to close the petition on that basis. Is that agreed? Yep. Okay, in that case I'm going to suspend briefly before we move to the next item on the agenda.
Okay, if I can call the meeting back to order, and can we now move on to um, agenda item three, consideration of new petitions. The first new petition for consideration is petition 1776 on Dogs Are Not Inanimate Objects, lodged by Mary Ann Parry Jones, calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the classification of dogs to sentient beings from inanimate objects for the purpose of legal action on dog theft. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, yeah, I think we should be writing to the Scottish Government to ask for their views on this. I was actually quite surprised that um, there are no official statistics on dog theft, especially if when we see from the papers that Dogs Trust have said that incidents of dog theft have been increasing over the past few years. Um, I think we all are aware that the Scottish Government do see dogs and other mammals as <coughs> sentient beings and we should absolutely be um, classifying them as such for the purposes of um, keeping track of um, dog thefts and so yeah absolutely right to Scottish Government to get their views. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. You know, being being a doggy person myself, I think that uh, you know, I think we would recognise that, that, that a loss of a pet, especially under these circumstances, is oh, is hurt is kind of mm -hmm. distressing in the way that the dogs are parts of the family and all that kind of uh, thought. I think that the the idea that we don't one one, we don't know how many there are and two, the, the way in which that's treated. I think uh, I think uh, I agree with mm -hmm. Gail Ross that we definitely should pursue this, and I think the first course of action is right to the Scottish Government. Okay, I mean there is a kind of a crossover to what the Public Petitions Committee has done in the past around puppy farming and yeah, that whole idea that it's a, a trade yeah. and a business and feels a bit unregulated and unsafe, mm -hmm. um, and that on the other hand, the amount of investment, personal investment, people have in their in their dogs' idea. They wouldn't be recognised if they've been stolen or whatever. Yeah. I think it's something that people we would share their concerns. So I think we are agreeing to write the Scottish Government seeking its views and the action called for in the petition. Yeah, I agree entirely on that. And I think but also there's reference to dog fighting, in other words, being stolen for that. Yeah. I think I've always been unhappy about this never being investigated properly. Yeah. So I think if you make some reference to the concerns of that, to so like a three prong attack, yeah. both Greyhound. puppy farming, Greyhound. dog fighting, well. and theft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are oh, yeah. huh? We're on a roll here. We can go greyhound as well, we're, but the oh, whole dog right, community. Now, sorry, we're all just breaking down our discipline now. <laughs> yes, it is an issue around greyhounds, and we're going to deal with that separately because there's quite a lot of um, responses to that. But I think we are agreeing um, to write in those terms the Scottish Government initially. Okay, thank you very much for that. We can now move to the second new petition for consideration, which is Petition 1778 on the review of the Scottish Landlords Register Scheme lodged by David Findl Findleton, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the effectiveness of the Scottish Landlords Registration Scheme. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I should perhaps declare an interest um, that I was, in fact, the Government Minister when this was brought in, so that shows you how long ago it was. Um, but it was um, intended to try and um, ensure that landlords understood their responsibility to their tenants and to their community, and that they shouldn't be in receipt of public funds um, if, no, if they couldn't be identified. So you shouldn't have been able to let out properties without um, being visible and to be seen to have applied some um, tests. However, that was the way back in the day, the purpose of all of that. Um, so I wonder if people have comments or suggestions for action on this petition. I think Convener, we should write to the Scottish Government and the Association of Landlords to seek their views on this because this is a, a rising concern at the moment. I know a case in my area where it's, it had to be a question where a, a, a landlord has been struck off because of unsensible actions mm -hmm. um, and not looking after his, uh, his or her um, uh, um, tenants. So I, I would strongly see let's get what the government position is on this and the Association of Landlords, and if there's any tightening up needs to be done. Mm -hmm. well, I think certainly, if I recall correctly, and I think it's also in here, that landlord groups, a lot of them, while they had reservations, were keen that there would be a distinction made between good landlords, mm -hmm. people who took their job seriously, and identifying rogue landlords. And the question is whether that registration scheme now does that. I mean, I don't know whether it would be worth um, just writing to COSLA 2 to ask them to what extent 
this is an issue. I, mean, I, I think there are some concerns that even when it was being implemented, it wasn't given the level of priority you might have expected. And if you don't res resource enforcement, it's actually very difficult for it to be effective. I absolutely mm. agree with that. I know a couple of local authorities where they're not being enforced things properly, um, and I think we should make sure that's included and would strongly advise we write to Cosner. Okay. Yes. Is that absolutely. agreed? Yep. In that case, we're agreeing to write to Scottish Government, Scottish Association of Landlords, and also to COSLA, asking for the reviews and the action called for in, in the petition. If that's agreed, we can then move on to the third new petition for consideration, which is Petition 1779, on reducing the risk of ovarian cancer, lodged by Denise Hooper, calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to raise public awareness of the importance of the CA125 blood test to help detect ovarian cancer and that endometriosis <coughs> can cause an increased risk of ovarian cancer. We have received a very thorough briefing on this petition and the actions called for in it. The briefing notes that fewer than 2% of women with endometriosis will go on to develop ovarian cancer. It also advises that because a number of other conditions lead to an increase in CA125 levels, it's not an appropriate test for population-wide screening for ovarian cancer. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, very emotive subject, obviously. Um, I think that, I mean, it's not for, it's not for us to, to, to claim any medical knowledge in this, uh, in this sphere, so we have to be led by what the clinicians say, and I think the, the, um, the submission that says that the, there are other conditions that, that, that could, be, could be related to an increase of CA125 levels, um, and the, the questioning of the test in itself, um, I think leads us to say how, how how would we as a petitions committee manage to take that forward, given that you know, it's it, we're, we're we're always going to take the advice of, of cl clinical experts in this particular uh, in these particular subjects. So, I think you know, diff difficult though this 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 um, subject is, uh, and understanding where the petitioner is trying to go, I think it's very difficult for us, you know, to be, to be able to, to be able to take this forward to to, to uh, against the petitioner's wishes or, or mm -hmm. to to realise the petitioner's wishes. Yeah, I mean, I think the de desire for people to be vigilant, um, and we would all wish to detect any cancer early and ovarian cancer early, and certainly our briefing tells us that too often it's it's detected very late, but the solution that has been suggested by the petition is not one that would necessarily do that. I think that seems to be um, that the, the, what the briefing tells us, that um, it wouldn't be distinct and it wouldn't be appropriate for population-wide screening. Um, but it doesn't mean that the, I think the issues and concerns that have driven the petition are still there. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I think we should get some updated views from the Scottish Government, Chair, um, on this as well. I think... Um, I mean, it's a difficult one, very difficult one, but it, it's very emotional, as mm -hmm. we've already rightly said. Uh, and I think to do it due credence, I, I would be happier if we got an updated position from the government on uh, the medical mm -hmm. you know, situation and what they've done since the last, you know, since it was raised before. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, that is the, the choice we have, is either to close the petition and recognise that what's been asked for um, it's not the solution to the problem, which is how you detect early. Um, and if we write to the Scottish Government, they will come back and tell us what we've been told here, that that test is not, is not going to do what was expected of it. Um, and then what other members' views are, the other, the other alternative would be... Sorry, there's a strange noise. So it says spend briefly. Thanks, and my apologies for the brief um, um, pause in our in our considerations for matters out with our control. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think we are recognising this is a very serious issue about how we make sure that people who have ovarian cancer identified early. 
the advice we've been given is that the, the proposal from the petitioner is not going to solve that problem. It's not going to address that problem. And if we ask the Scottish Government, that's what they'll come back and say. So we have to decide whether we want to close the petition or write to the Scottish Government and ask, if not this, then what might be an option. Um, or in closing it, write to the Scottish Government and flag up this, this question of what the petitioner has raised. I think these are the choices in front of us. I mean, the, 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 the final point you made there, Chair, uh, yes, I think I just I just have this thing about I think we should flag it up. Um, you, even if we close it, we should flag it up, the importance okay. of this. Brian? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the if not what. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a way forward. I think, I think if you write to, you know, the Scottish Government write to the, CM, the CMO, <coughs> will come back with the, exactly the same um, mm -hmm. response as the other clinicians have done. But I do like the idea of writing and. and Perhaps closing the petition. I do like the idea of writing to the Scottish Government saying, if this is not not the way to detect early, what are you doing to you know, what, yeah, what else are we doing exactly. to ensure that detection uh, you know, the detection rates are, are are raised? I think that would be yeah. a, a good compromise. I, I would agree with that. And, and you know, uh, Morris Corey did say about the work that had been done before, and the answer um, that Jean Freeman gave, and that was in 2018 yeah. about the detect early campaign. So. You know, it, it, it might be worthwhile if we were to close it, j just doing exactly that and writing to see, you know, how that campaign yeah, has has, <coughs> yeah, has gone. Yeah. You know, for the for the people concerned. That would make me, yeah, and, and that would make me more comfortable mm. as well with the fact that you know this the petitioner has taken the time to, mm -hmm. you know, put it all yeah, together and yeah, instead of just you know, <coughs> closing it outright, I, I would be more comfortable to, to take. Oh, that obviously, if we close the petition, that will not come back to us. I wonder if it's possible in writing to the Scottish government saying, you know, we're closing the petition because this is not the solution. We want to know and be reassured that you you are recognise the need for early detection mm -hmm. and that they would be in contact with the petitioner to yeah. do yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. Would that be agreed? Absolutely. Okay, in that case, we're, we're agreeing to close it in, in those in those terms, um, but we are going to flag up to Scottish Government that there is an issue here about early detection of this, of this cancer um, and that we would ask them to engage with the petitioner. We'd want to thank the petitioner very much for um, highlighting these issues to us and, of course, to emphasise that they have a right to return in a year's time with a, uh, a petition if they feel that is necessary. But we would want to thank them in the meantime for, I think, raising a, um, a very serious concern for a significant number yeah. of women. Yeah. Okay, if that's agreed, we can then move on um, to petition 1780, which is the final petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1780 in the consultation on the closure of large shops on New Year's Day, lodged by Stuart Forrest on behalf of USDA, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to launch a consultation on implementing legislation already in place to ban large shops from opening on New Year's Day. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, again, I should flag up that, in fact, I was very closely engaged with this um, in the Parliament that debated this and when the, the compromise position was that we would act on Christmas Day, we would consult further um, on, on New Year's Day and, um, and subsequent to that, um, it wasn't done um, and it wasn't, um, but the incoming government didn't do it. And I think the point in the, in, in the petition is that we should actually look at this again and to ask the Scottish Government to do so. Um, it is a controversial issue for some people. I should declare an instance that I, I absolutely support it, I think. The, um, in retail, mm. um, we know that there are campaigns around protecting uh, shop workers from abuse, but also we know that in the world of uh, fragile work, a lot of people in retail are the ones who are very, very ones who are going in when everybody else is on holiday, from increasingly long hours and circumstances where they don't even get paid extra for working longer hours so, or different hours from in the past. So it's something I am um, generally quite interested in. But I wonder if we have views. Brian? I think, g given, it's, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, there seems to be a piece of work that was ongoing that's been interrupted. Um, and therefore, it hasn't been, you know, hasn't, it hasn't been delivered to its conclusion. So, if there was, if there was, if the agreement was 
to look uh, to, to do some evidence gathering and some um, uh, delving into this, and that hasn't been done. Surely, the, the way forward for this petition then is to write to the Scottish government and ask them if they will, they will pick that back up again Absolutely. and take that forward. Yeah, yeah I mean, I th my recollection it was so so it, 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 it there was a change of government in 2007. It had been hugely controversial. I wouldn't pretend that there was a consensus far from it, and the compromise across the peace was they would settle on Christmas Day, but the compromise was that we then look at consultation. But to be fair to the Scottish Government, um, at post-2007, they were clear that they weren't going to take that forward. So they made that decision that they weren't going to take it forward. So I suppose the question is um, that we would be wanting to write to the Scottish Government asking whether it would now look at taking that consultation forward. We are talking a very significant um, period of time since then, and, and, and indeed the retail sector will have changed since then yeah. and have become more fragmented for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so are we agreeing to write the Scottish Government seeking its views on the action called for um, in the petition? Yes. And obviously, subsequent to that, there will be an opportunity for um, Stuart Forrest and USDO to, to respond in their, um, to what the Scottish Government says at that point. Is that agreed? Absolutely. Okay, in that case, uh, that brings us to the end of our uh, meeting in public, and we're now moving into private session.